I'm uh, Stuart Benzi. I'm going to speak to you today about springboarding junctions. Um, I'm going to speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, if anybody's got any questions, um, feel free to put them into the chat function at the bottom uh, and I'll try and answer them at the end. Um, if you don't want to answer them in the, in the chat function, feel free to email me. Um, my email address was on the, the slide that was on at the start and it will come back on at the end. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stuart Benzi. I'm a barrister at Two Temple Gardens. I'm a commercial practitioner. Um, I, my practice is focused um, a lot on things which involve urgent injunctive relief. Um, so quite a lot of fraud, um, particularly fraud committed by employees. Um, a lot of um, employment focused on um, high court injunctive employment work, um, some sports law and then general commercial work. Um, I've said, talked about questions. Also, um, some of you may know Two Temple Gardens has a series of practical guides. Um, we don't have one on the string board injunctions, but I'm in the process of putting one together, um, by which, as you probably guess, that means I've said I have, I'll do it and I haven't. Um, but now, having admitted that publicly, I'll, I'll get it um, on our website within the next couple of weeks. So, moving on to spring board injunctions, I've I called this um, lecture a um, spring board injunctions a bigger splash. That's partly because it's a pun based on a famous David Hockney um, picture, but also because in the context of this sort of employment litigation, springboard injunctions are an incredibly powerful weapon. Um, we often talk about freezing orders as being the nuclear weapon of, um, of litigation, um, and lots of people have doubted that for very various reasons. But realistically, um, if you're in the middle of the sort of litigation where you've got employees who have taken confidential information and, and gone into competition, um, the springboard injunction is the scorched earth policy. Um, and it's often very, very attractive to clients because in a couple of clients' perspective, the ability to effectively shut down competitors for a period of time is obviously very attractive. Um, I'm going to break the, speech, the talk down to four components. The, the first will be a, an overview of what we're talking about and what, what conceptually a springboard injunction is. Um, I'm then going to talk about the eight core concepts of springboard injunctions, um, which are drawn from the, uh, the well-known case of um, the judgment of Mr Justice Haddon Cave in the QE and Dimmock case. Um, having done that, we'll then focus in on the eighth of those principles, which is the nature of the advantage gained. Uh, and we'll do that by reference to a case called Aquinas um, and Miller, which is a case in which I appeared with um, Ruth Kennedy, who's also from Two, two, two Temple Gardens on behalf of the defendants. Uh, and then I'll close by um, summing up and um, giving you three or four core points that I think you should take from um, this talk. Uh, and if we've got time, um, and I'm aware it's a hot day, um, I can give you a couple of observations um, about how I found making these sorts of applications, albeit I haven't made a springboard application, but a, a uh, confidentiality employee type application um, in the context of COVID. Right, so moving on, what's the concept? I think the best, um, the best phrase to uh, use is a phrase that uh, Mr Justice Flo um, coined in a case called Secretrack and Satematics. Um, which is um, illegitimate competitive advantage. And those three words uh, really encapsulates what this is all about. Um, when, when our commercial clients look at these injunctions, what they want to do is put people out of business and there's various other collateral things they want. But when you're looking at these injunctions, it's good to always be focused on that idea of an illegitimate competitive advantage. Um, and the aim conceptually is simply to say when you've got somebody who's committed a wrong, um, it is to deny that wrongdoer the ability to take advantage of their own wrongdoing. And that's a, a principle of English law which goes back um, at least to the 19th century. Um, many of you will know the case of Anglia and Saunders Building Society, which is a 1970 House of Lords case, um, which talks about that principle. Um, so moving on. There are three uh, key evidential challenges um, when you're making these applications. Uh, and I'll, I'll set them out now, and we'll probably come back to them in due course. The first is you need to establish a breach of duty. Now, it, it was often thought that these, these um, injunctions were confined to situations where you had breach of, confidential, breach of confidentiality. Um, now, to some extent, in reality, most of them are dealing with breaches of confidentiality because that's how these cases tend to arise. But it doesn't have to be that. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the, uh, the principles in QB and Dimmock. Secondly, loss. Now, I'm, I'm a slight of a loss obsessive in these cases because loss is rarely a huge issue substantive, substantively in the application. 
But it's one of those things that I think you always need to keep your eye on that lost ball because you can spend quite a lot of money in these applications. Um, and, and then you end up in a situation where, because of the injunction, you prevent any further loss. And you end up in proceedings against people who are often not, uh, often don't have particularly deep pockets, where you don't have any loss to claim. And it's always worth, um, you know, with the client, bearing in mind the, um, the cost benefit of these sorts of injunctions, particularly in situations where, as I say, clients are often very, very gung ho about these sorts of remedies. And then finally, and crucially, and really the issue that this talk will center around is the unfair advantage itself. Now, as I've said, I think keeping the term illegitimate competitive advantage in your head is a really good way to think about this because all three of those things matter. Um, but we'll go on and we will look in turn at um, what you need to establish uh, to persuade a court that that uh, advantage exists. So moving on to the eight uh, principles in QB and DIMUC. Now I'm going to go through the eight. These principles were, I say, set out in a case um, which was 1991. Um, Mr. Justice Haddon Cave, as he then was, he's now in full appeal. Um, and these eight principles have stuck. So uh, when we look at Aquinas and Miller in that judgment, the judge sets them out verbatim, uh, and most other um, of the reported cases rely on them verbatim. So it's quite important to have them. It's also, I mean, if you're instructed in one of these, the nature of, um, of these applications is they don't come up every day. So I don't know if there is anybody out there, um, whether a uh, solicitor or barrister, who's doing these on a day-in, day-out basis, but I doubt it. Um, I, I do, I think, as many as most people, and probably a, two or three a year is realistic. So it's always worth going back to these principles to remind yourself of what it is we're actually doing. Now, I will say at the outset, I think a lot of these principles overlap, so I apologise for that in advance. Um, principle one, that the purpose is to deprive the defendant um, of any head start. So that's the first point to, um, to, to bear in mind. And it's something we'll talk about when we get to Aquinas and Miller. There's a confusion between how long it will take to establish a business and actually the length of the head start you get as a consequence of your unlawful ability. So it's purely to deprive the um, wrongdoer of that head start. Um, principle two, and again, something of an overlap here, um, the injunction is to prevent the defendant from taking an unfair advantage of the springboard created by their own unlawful conduct. And that goes back to what I said earlier about the underlying legal principle that wrongdoers shouldn't be able to benefit from their own, own conduct. But it also lies within a much more overarching principle um, that you must confine the relief that you're getting to simply depriving them of that advantage and nothing else. Um, the third principle, and I, I think I would say it's the second most important principle. Um, I, I, I sort of referred to it earlier. Um, the, um, the, the relief sort is not restricted purely to misuse of confidential information. Um, it can apply to any breach of contract of employment. Um, in addition to that, um, and we'll talk more about this in a second, in addition to that, uh, breaches of fiduciary duty, um, breaches of the actual duty of confidence, um, and importantly, um, breaches of database regulations. Now, why are they important? Well, de dealing with, um, in, in turn, many people on here will be used to dealing with this sort of litigation. Uh, and when you have employees who behave in this way, uh, it's almost invariable that they will allege that their contract was breached before um, they did whatever they did wrong. So they'll allege a repudiatory breach and therefore say that any post-termination restrictions and or any confidentiality restrictions are no longer valid. Um, and by being able to rely on other breaches, um, you get around that initial problem. The, the other issue, of course, is where it's confidentiality. Um, and it, but it's often the case that when you're looking at what are often lists of, um, of clients or customers, there's usually an argument that, well, hold on, all of this in the, in the, in the uh, public domain, you can go on Google and you can get all this. Um, and, and that's particularly where the database regulations are important because the database regulations, you merely have to prove a database as it's defined in the regulations. And, and importantly, the information in a database does not have to be confidential. Uh, and that's all important because what it means is that if you go into a, an application simply relying um, on breach of the contract, you've already set up a, a hurdle to jump because you're almost certainly going to get all this um, stuff coming back about why you can't rely on those and that's going to put doubt in the judge's mind. Rarely, in my experience, does the judge make a, a, a finding against you in those, but it does happen. Um, but if you've got the alternative pegs to hang the injunction on, it's a much stronger application. So moving on to uh, principle four, 
um, fairly straightforward. You've got to apply for the injunction while the advantage is still being enjoyed. I think I'm not going to labour that. Obviously, it'd be a bit odd if you were to apply for an injunction to prevent an advantage that has stopped. <clears throat> Principle five, um, the purpose is to restore the parties to the position they would have been in, but for the, the wrongful conduct. Um, and we all like about four tests and here we've got one. Um, I think the way that to best understand this um, is in QBE, um, where uh, Hagen Cave said that if by granting the injunction, it creates some other detriment to the defendant or some other collateral benefit to the claimant, that might be a good reason to say it's not just and fair to um, to, to grant the injunction uh, and so again it comes down to this fact that the, the, the judicial approach to these injunctions is that they are very powerful very broad but they have to be narrowed as much as possible um, and I'll refer to cases Devere, uh, Devere Holding uh, Company Limited and Belgravia Wealth Management um, which is a judgment of um, Mr Justice Simler and um, where she makes the same point very clearly um, and, um, and she also goes on to talk about how the injunction um, must not go beyond the narrow confines of the advantage it's gained. Uh, and we'll see how that develops in due course when we look at Aquinas. Um, principle six, um, the injunction won't be granted if damage is an adequate remedy. Well, I think everybody um, is probably familiar with that. That's um, common um, language in injunctive um, territory. Um, in these cases, I, I, in my experience is it's rarely a problem because um, you've often got employees on the other side uh, and you're often in a situation of saying that because you're trying to prevent them taking advantage of the, of the benefit, that the loss that uh, is suffered, it hasn't been suffered already, it's going to be suffered in the future. And if you've got the evidence to persuade the judge that that advantage exists, it's unlikely that you'll find a judge who's not willing to infer that the um, possession of that advantage isn't going to cause some loss to the claimant. So rarely, rarely an issue in these cases. Then moving on to point seven, um, and again this is an sort of overarching point, uh, these are not punitive orders. Um, clients think they're punitive orders um, and in reality they may well be very punitive orders but as a matter of principle they're not there to punish, they're purely there to provide just protection on an interim basis. And again, I refer to Mrs. Justice Simler's um, decision in Devere Holdings. Um, she goes so far as to say, and I'll, I'll just look at it for the time being, um, that the, uh, the, the, the need for the injunction um, is to grant us protect against and prevent further loss rather be, than being used to punish um, for past breaches. And then finally, we come to, um, uh, I was going to say, last and definitely not least the eighth principle which in QBE was said to be that the defendant must spell out precisely the benefit that's been gained, the advantage that's been gained. Um, I didn't go much further than that only to say that an ephemeral or a short-term advantage will not be sufficient. Now as I say the, the, what was required in there was simply to spell out what the advantage was. Now that was dealt, that was looked at by um, Nick Vinyl QC who was the judge in a case called um, uh, Aquinas and Miller, uh, in which I appeared for two of the defendants, and Ruth Kennedy from Two Temple Gardens appeared for the other two. Um, now, the facts of Aquinas are fairly straightforward. Um, Aquinas was a recruitment consultancy, um, and they recruited teachers and placed teachers with schools in the East Midlands area and in parts of London. The first and second defendant were um, uh, pr former professional footballers, albeit they were very young and they, hadn't, they, weren't, they weren't premiership rich footballers, they, they they'd, uh, had to go and find something else to do. Uh, and they both commenced employment with Aquinas uh, and they were both very good. In fact, one in particular was extremely successful uh, and they were making a lot of money for Aquinas. Now, what happened was um, the third defendant was a friend of theirs, also another former um, footballer in the same situation. Um, and together with some financial assistance from D3's father, they decided to set up a business. Now, the, the evidence was that they looked at other businesses and they looked at setting up a gym and so forth. But they eventually alighted on the idea of setting up a recruitment consultancy that placed teachers with schools in the, in the East Midlands. Uh, who knows where they got that idea from? Um, and they did that. Um, and in the, in the early stages, whilst um, D1 and D2 were still employed by Aquinas, they placed some teachers with schools 
uh, and the value of that business, which was admitted, was £15,000. So we admitted that was £15,000 that would otherwise have been made by Aquinas. The, um, probably the, the only other factual matter is that Aquinas strategy was owned by um, a very well-known footballer who wrote a um, joint genus, and I will say, he plays for a small club in North London called Tottenham. Um, and he wrote a very, very interesting email to one of the um, defendants who is his, his cousin, in which he made all sorts of threats. And I wasn't going to refer to it because it was so relevant and it looked so cheap. But the first thing the judge said when he came in was, um, this is the case that Mr. Genus is involved in, isn't it? Um, and then he said he wrote that email. So there's um, an important thing there, particularly when you're talking to your trainees about not writing letters that you don't want read out in court. So, the judge, um, I mean, clearly going back to our three evidential challenges. So breach, there's no problem, we admit it. Loss, there's no problem, we admit it. And clearly in these circumstances, it would be an odd judge that won't infer the, the potential for future loss. The third point, of course, is the interesting point is, what is the advantage they've gained? And just to put it in context, um, the hearing um, that the judgment refers to was the third hearing. Um, I hadn't been the first, but I've been the second and third. So we were now six weeks down the line from the initial application. Um, so, and they'd had the injunction in place up until this hearing. So they had six weeks protection. So they had to establish that they had an advantage. Now the judge uh, in dealing with that said there were two issues. Uh, the first issue was what is the standard of proof that the claim had to reach? And the second was, firstly, what was the nature of the advantage gained? And then he added, um, and how, what was the length of that advantage? Now, I'll deal with those two points separately. The first one's easy. I think most people will be familiar with the situation where you're applying for an interim injunction, but the effect of the interim injunction is that it gives you something like final relief. Um, and in most of these cases, um, you're going to be in that area. And in this situation, the judge held, and the, um, I think most people, it's Lansing, Linden, Kerr's Judgment Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Staunton, um, who held that in those circumstances, rather than having the normal American cyanamide test, what you have to show is that on the balance of probabilities um, that you're likely to succeed at trial. So, first of all, of course, the claimants have now got that larger hurdle to cross. So the second hurdle they had to get over was establishing an advantage. Well, I think the judge accepted, in principle, there could be an advantage. Um, one of the problems with this was, and I mentioned it in passing, is that the information they provided was large volumes of, um, of email addresses. And they were sort of generic email addresses, such as info at the name of the school or headmaster at the name of the school. So there was a real live issue as to whether any of the information was confidential anyway. Um, but the judge didn't seem to want to find for us on the basis that there was no confidentiality and there clearly were breaches of contract in any event. So the judge, having said that, then focused um, very much on the length of the advantage. And he asked my opponent on um, at least three occasions, can you tell me exactly what the length is? Now, their application said that they wanted a, uh, an injunction which was no less than nine months and no more than 12 months. Now, as we'll see, it's the way the judgment came out, when you're trying to establish a, um, the length of the advantage, giving a three-month range probably isn't going to be much use to you. And it did put my opponent in a very difficult position because every time the judge asked him, what's the length? He sort of said, well, it's somewhere between nine months and 12 months. And the judge would say, well, how much is it? Is it nine months or is it 12 months? And the problem is that on the evidence, I'll come to the evidence in a second, there really wasn't an answer. Um, the evidence they had um, was simply this. It was the witness statement of the managing director of Aquinas, in which he said, I set up um, this agency. I'm experienced in running a specialist teacher recruitment agency. In my view, it would take not least than nine months to set up and place one teacher with one school um, and it may take as much as 12 months. Now from a starting point, um, even just conceptually, it was easy to say to the judge that seems a bit unlikely. Um, we had evidence and it was quite good evidence and it wasn't challenged that there's a national shortage of certain types of teacher um, and there were schools out there crying out for these teachers um, and there were places, um, including LinkedIn, but also more specialist areas where you could go and find teachers. Uh, and my two defendants were particularly skilled in finding teachers. So the idea that it was going to take them nine months to find a teacher and place them with a school seemed um, unlikely at best. But the judge in dealing with that evidence was utterly dismissive. Um, he said it was of no use to him. Um, he said he'd give it no weight whatsoever, wasn't independent, it was opinion. 
Uh, and if you look at paragraphs 59 and 60 of the decision, um, he basically says it was of no use at all. So at that stage, when the judge has said, you need to prove the length of the, uh, the, the advantage and your evidence is useless, uh, really at that stage, they were almost uh, at an end. So in, in, in short, really, that is the importance of that case. Now, it's probably not tr entirely true to say that no case before has ever said you must prove the length. Um, I, I mentioned De Vere Holdings um, and Belgravia. In that case, uh, Mrs Justice Simler did say that the injunction shouldn't go beyond the length of the, um, of the advantage. But it wasn't clearly set out that you need to evidentially prove what the length of the advantage is. Um, so how, what's the answer? How do you prove the length of the advantage? Well, I think when I first thought this through, the, idea, the answer was it has to be expert evidence because I can't see any other way. I think it is possible that you could obtain evidence if you could find another business and you could persuade that business to explain how they set their business up and presuming it was relatively recent. Um, and they could say how long it took them to establish and how long it took them to get themselves going and make some money. Um, but that evidence as lay evidence, um, absent any opinion, would be of some use. However, in the real world, it seems very unlikely that you're going to find that evidence. And is it likely you're going to find a competitor in the same market um, that's going to want to help um, an incumbent to, uh, to try and put somebody else out of business? Who knows? Maybe you don't. Now, what sort of expert are we um, looking at? Um, it can be quite difficult because, uh, you know, conventionally speaking, an expert in setting up employment agencies isn't something that we'd normally think of when we're considering the, the, the contents of Part 35. But I think that's where we are. That if you've got um, employees who are setting up in competition, you need to find somebody who has a degree of expertise in that area, who is independent and who can provide an expert opinion. Um, and I think realistically, um, that's the only way that you will be able to set out, um, even on the American Sinemid test, but certainly um, on the balance of probabilities, the only way you'll be able to establish the nature of the advantage, and in particular, the length of the advantage. I'll move on to the, the uh, fourth point. I'm going to do it fairly briefly, which is loss. Now, I, I made the point earlier about loss, which is that in terms of actually getting successfully achieving your um, injunction, it's rarely a problem um, because in circumstances where you have enough evidence to make the application, it's likely a judge will infer the potential to cause loss. But as I said, you've often got a situation where a, um, a uh, client is chomping at the bit to go for the injunction. Uh, and what you have to do is consider the cost benefit. Now, Aquinas is probably not the archetypal case, but just to put it in context, by the end of the hearing where the injunction was discharged, Aquinas has cost, I think, in excess of a quarter of a million pounds. Um, now, obviously, I wasn't acting for the claimant, I was acting for defendants, but I can't conceive that even in the nine-month period um, that their losses would have amounted to that, um, even given how skilled our defendants were. So the first thing to do is to sit down with a client and say to them, if we don't injunct, what will your losses be? And then you can compare that to the potential costs that you might incur. Now, some of you might say, well, hold on, the whole purpose of the injunction is to prevent those losses. So there's nothing wrong with preventing the losses and then going on, and that's absolutely right, of course. But as a matter of commercial reality, if you've got people, it's often the case in my experience on the other side, who aren't gonna be good for huge amounts of costs. If it costs you 50, 60, 100,000 pounds to get the injunction, you then go on, and the, the, what, what often happens is you go to a situation where you're now telling the client, we're now preparing for a CCMC, and we've got a trial in a year, 18 months. And all you're gonna get at that trial is, is, is permanent injunctions and some sort of relatively small amount of damages. Um, they will have incurred a huge amount of costs and they're looking at, um, at defendants on the other side of the table who may well not be able to pay those costs. And it's quite an awkward position to get in and it puts you in a very difficult position in mediations where in a mediation you're saying, well, we've got your bank to rights, um, pay us X. And they will simply sit there and saying, you've seen our assets, we've got nothing. So I, I think while costs aren't a substantive issue in these claims, they are a vital issue um, in giving the, the correct commercial advice to the clients. So moving on to conclusions. Um, I think I've set out four key conclusions. Um, 
The first is that the minute you're instructed in these cases, your immediate focus has got to be on getting the evidence to show the nature of the uh, illegitimate competitive advantage and the particular length of the illegitimate competitive advantage. And as I've said, it seems likely that will often have to be an expert report of some description. Um, secondly, don't hang your application just on contractual terms. Um, contractual terms are always vulnerable in these cases. Um, my experience is some judges are happier to enforce post-termination restrictions than others. Uh, if you get one of the judges that really isn't happy, though, certainly in the past have been some who almost never <laughs> um, enforced uh, post-termination restrictions, it can cause a problem for the application as a whole. Almost inevitably in these cases, you will have equitable um, duties of confidence. Um, in terms of fiduciary duties, obviously, if you're not dealing with people who are at the level that they will attract fiduciary duties, consider whether or not um, there may be a fiduciary obligation in relation to use of the company's property. Now, I, I've pleaded this in probably every case I've done. I've never actually got to a stage where a judge has made a decision or a final decision on it. But it's the sort of conventional idea of fiduciary duties. If I give somebody a pound to go and get me a newspaper, they owe me fiduciary um, responsibilities in relation to the pound and the newspaper. So if you give an employee free range on intellectual property and they misuse it, there's at least a very good arguable case in my view um, that that would be a bridge for fiduciary duty. So that's pleadable. And then as I said, the, uh, the database regulations are your friend. Um, database regulations, no need for contractual terms, no need for confidentiality. Um, and they are the ones which if all else fails will generally keep you in the game. Um, thirdly, um, not something I've talked about so far, but get forensic IT people um, into the game as soon as possible. Um, there are some very good people out there. I've worked with a couple of them on numerous occasions. Um, it still is remarkable. I mean, I, I, worked in, I worked on one case when we were dealing with um, very sophisticated IT professionals who had sent the most bizarre emails to each other, giving in great detail um, how they were, while still employed by the claimants, effectively working in competition for a defendant. Um, they were pressing delete, they were doing it on web-based emails, all of which was recovered, uh, recovered and recoverable. Also, often when you've got people plugging devices, USB-based devices and exporting matters, very often the uh, IT experts can tell you when the um, USB was plugged in and very often where, what was exported. Um, and that's often key in these uh, cases. And then finally, um, I've made this point before already, loss, loss, loss. Um, I think from a commercial point of view, it, it's always to focus the client's mind on what really is the risk that you're dealing with. So that, that concludes uh, my talk on exactly 25 minutes. So I'm very pleased with myself. Um, I, I'll, I'll briefly um, say a couple of words about applications um, in the uh, COVID context. Um, start off by saying, I, I think I said earlier, I haven't made an application for a springboard injunction um, you know, during the COVID period, but I have made um, two applications in uh, these sorts of employee confidentiality cases. Um, the first one was a without notice application, which if it hadn't been I mean, for COVID would have been a freezing order. But because of COVID and because of the um, inability to find supervisor solicitors, IT experts and search teams who were willing to do it, um, we, download, we downgraded it to a um, essentially a sort of socially distanced quasi um, doorstep delivery up order. So we got an order which uh, on the front page had very stringent um, evidence preservation um, provisions um, obviously backed up with um, penal notices at the start and then they had an obligation to provide a witness statement within 24 hours the detailing where our listed items were some things we were looking for that most of you will know will be listed in the schedule and then within seven days they had to arrange for all their um, electronic devices to be couriered to the offices of um, Smith and Williamson who are our IT experts um, so they can be inspected um, in terms of the application itself, I think um, many of you will have probably been involved in talks about how to conduct um, remote litigation. Similar things applied. Firstly, um, skeleton argument is absolutely vital. Um, the, the, uh, we had um, a very good judge, and, but it's important that the skeleton argument in these situations gives you a real framework and, and sets out exactly what you want. Uh, the bundle, um, preferably a single PDF, paginated from start to finish. Also authorities bundles, single PDF, pagination from start to finish. And I think most importantly is time estimates. Um, I would say that if you consider what your time estimate would be for a live hearing, double it. Um, certainly that first one, which I say is the quasi-search order, I would have said that would have been a 45 minute application 
um, had I been standing in court 37, um, in reality it took slightly more than an hour and a half. Um, other than that, I think the courts are very happy to, uh, to accept these sorts of applications. Um, and in that one, my, my biggest concern really was how a court would respond to a without notice application in the current situation, but there was no difficulty with that at all. Um, whereas generally speaking, with these sorts of employment-based urgent interim um, applications, the courts have tended over the last sort of five years or so to become more and more restrictive and more and more wary of um, without notice applications. And I certainly have one where the judge eventually refused to give us the uh, the full um, the, the, the full order we saw. They gave us the uh, evidence preservation provisions, but then um, ordered a on notice hearing to deal with the um, the search of um, IT equipment and so forth. So um, that's all I've got to say. Um, I'm just shy of 30 minutes, so um, that's good. If anybody has any questions, and so far nobody has, but do please um, feel free to email me um, or give me a call if you want to. Thank you very much.